and uh, and and just paying attention out on boats that I worked on uh, have uh, have paid off. So I think uh, I think we'll we'll uh, uh, we'll do pretty well here. So um, so hopefully everybody's joining us. Uh, we had uh, uh, the first part here on uh, Monday. And um, I hope everybody got an opportunity to join for that. And we went through about two thirds of the uh, uh, ordinary requirements for, um, for rules of the road. So I'm gonna back up here real quick. I'm gonna throw that slide up to show the requirements again, just to refresh in everybody's mind what we're, uh, what we're going over. So. Uh, this is ordinary requirement nine navigation rules, um, the rules of the road. So on uh, Monday, we went over um, A through D. So we, uh, we talked about uh, the purpose of the navigation rules, international and inland. Uh, we talked about the rule of responsibility, um, stand on and give way vessels in meeting, crossing, and overtaking situations. Uh, we did uh, responsibility between vessels, which is commonly known as vessel priority. And then tonight we're gonna go over uh, nav lights for power driven and sailing vessels. And we're just gonna kind of um, go over like the basic navigation lights. Uh, navigation lights is a pretty big subject um, because there are so many different uh, combinations of nav lights, particularly in like the towing world where uh, you just throw up different numbers of lights and, and some different color combinations to try and, uh, you know, indicate length of tow and things like that. And that's stuff that you'll learn a lot more about when you're working on your ABLE requirement. Uh, you really dive into the rest of the navigation lights. So we're going to touch on basic power vessels and sailing vessels and smaller vessels. And then um, we're also going to go over sound signals for maneuvering, warning, and restricted visibility. And we're going to try and cover those for sort of all vessel types. Um, that's a, a little less broad than, than nav lights. So I'm going to jump in with a little bit of review, um, hopefully for anybody that joined us on Monday. This is just gonna be a quick review of what we did on Monday. And for anybody that wasn't able to join us, um, you'll at least get a little bit of a glimpse. And I believe um, if you weren't able to see us on Monday, there is, uh, um, you can watch the, the webinar via Facebook. Uh, it was recorded and should be available, so. Um, so we're going to start right into a quick review. Uh, we talked about explaining the purpose of the navigation rules, international and inland, and the fact that it's really pretty simple. The, the, the purpose of the rules is preventing collisions at sea. So that's, that's really it. Everything in this book is about preventing collisions at sea. There are rules that tell vessels how to interact with each other when they meet on the water. So in, in, uh, in such a fashion as to not run into each other. So that's, that's really it. If somebody says, hey, can you explain the purpose of the navigation rules? You say preventing collisions at sea. And um, that's uh, pretty concise, but it's, that's it. Um, so we talked about the rule of responsibility and we put up on the page, you know, everything that it says in the NAV rules book, which is really pretty wordy, but boiled it down to this, that the gist is that the rule of responsibility says that it is your responsibility to know the rules. That's knowing everything that's in this, uh, in this NAV rules book. Um, the 38 rules. Uh, I mentioned that we're going to cover about 22 of them throughout these two evenings. Um, knowing the hazards. What are the hazards to navigation when you're out on the water? You know, that could be shoals, that could be, you know, land, that could be, you know, just, you know, shallow water um, rocks that you may encounter that may pose navigational hazards when you're out there. Knowing the circumstances. Um, that's going to be like weather is, you know, is, is visibility difficult because it's raining really hard or it's really foggy. Um, or even um, I mentioned uh, marine events like a big sailing regatta. Um, can't tell you how many times 
encountered that when I used to work on tugboats on, on San Francisco Bay, and there'd be a big sailing regatta that we'd have to cross. And you need to try and, you know, respectfully find your way through. But um, we uh, had to cross one um, big boat series one time where there was boats strung out basically end to end from San Francisco to Berkeley. And we, you know, had to, to carefully find a path over to Oakland. So um, you got to also know your boat. And what that really means is you've got to know the difference between if you're on a big ship that is going to be slow to stop and slow to turn. Um, you know, big ships carry a lot of momentum. You got to know, you know, what your stopping distance is and what your turning circle is uh, versus like a little ski boat that's going to be pretty maneuverable. And uh, you should also be aware of, you know, how other people's boats are going to maneuver because as a, as a small boat, you don't want to be darting in and around a, a big ship that's, that's going to have more difficulty maneuvering. Um, and all of this so that you can avoid danger to others. So that's, that's the gist of the rule of responsibility is taking responsibility to know the rules, the hazards, circumstances, and uh, your boat and, and avoid you know, collision with others. Um, we talked about rule nine, and that's the one rule I said specifically you should know uh, by number. Um, this is particularly if you travel in areas with uh, a lot of uh, commercial traffic. So that's narrow channels. And the gist of rule nine says that small boats and sailboats should stay out of the way of, of ships that need their need the channel uh, to navigate. They may be too deep to navigate outside the channel, but uh, smaller boats are going to be able to, um, you know, sail just outside the channel in order to uh, to give that channel to the to the big ships. Um, it says that you shouldn't fish across the channel. Uh, you shouldn't, you know, lay your nets or or lines across the channel where ships are going to need to go. Um, you know, and don't cross the channel right in front of a big ship, you know, cross behind them um, so that they can uh, continue on their way safely. And uh, it also says that if you're in an overtaking situation, the boat in front gets to decide if it's safe to pass in a narrow channel. So if the boat in front feels that there's not enough room um, in the narrow channel, then uh, you're going to have to uh, continue at their speed until um, there's, there's safe room. So we also talked a little about giveaway vessels and uh, stand on vessels. And we talked about knowing who the giveaway vessel is. So this was a, uh, a two sailboats meeting. And we said that in this case, vessel A is going to be the giveaway vessel because vessel A, if two sail sailing vessels are meeting on different tacks, that means they have the wind on opposite sides. So you'll notice vessel A has a port tack, the wind is coming from their port side, and vessel B, the wind is coming from their starboard side. So in this case, vessel A on the port tack is going to give way. So vessel A is going to need to maneuver so that vessel B can continue on their way. And we said that the stand on vessel, their job is to maintain course and speed so that and, and let the giveaway vessel maneuver around them. Um, so that's port tack giveaway. Uh, we remember we remember that that way. Uh, we talked about another situation with two sailboats meeting where they have the wind on the same side. So both of these vessels are on a port tack, but one of them is gonna give way and one of them is going to uh, stand on. So in this case, Vessel A is going to be the stand-on vessel, and Vessel B is going to be the giveaway vessel because Vessel B is to windward. Vessel B is closer to the wind or more upwind. And that's because if Vessel B were to cross in front of Vessel A, Vessel B would block Vessel A's wind, and Vessel A would have a more difficult time um, continuing and maneuvering. So Vessel B is going to need to maneuver in such a fashion to go around Vessel A, so Vessel A can maintain course and speed as the stand, stand on vessels. So that's windward give way, we remember. Um, so then the last sailboat situation we talked about was what if you're on a port tack and you see a vessel to windward, you might assume that as the, uh, as, as the leeward vessel or uh, further from the wind vessel, 
that you're the stand on vessel. But if that vessel is so far out in the distance that you can't tell which direction they're going, or maybe visibility is reduced, it's a little foggy or rainy or, or something is making it difficult for you to tell which tack that vessel is on, then vessel A, which is on a port tack, you would assume then that you're the giveaway vessel because you're on a port tack. So we remember that by saying port tack give way if you can't say. So if you can't say what tack the other vessel is on, you you give way um, uh, because you are on a port tack. So that, that takes precedence. Um, we also talked about uh, how to know if you're, a, if you're a power vessel. So if we assume that two power vessels from the same, that are the same type of vessel, same vessel category were to meet. So they're otherwise the same type of vessel. Uh, they don't, um, the give way and stand on vessels aren't determined by vessel priority, then uh, you would determine the, the, the give way vessel by, by the vessel on the left. So you'll notice vessel B is to the left of vessel A or, or to the port side of vessel A, whereas vessel A is to the right or starboard side of vessel B. So in, in any configuration, you know, they could be kind of crossing like this or crossing more steeply, the vessel on the left is gonna be the giveaway vessel. And that's because what we'll learn about today is nav lights, you'll notice that vessel B is looking at vessel A's red nav light, whereas vessel A is looking at vessel B's green nav light. So if you remember that the uh, red nav light is on the port side and green nav light on the starboard side, you'll see that vessel A has a green light and vessel B has a red light. So we remember that vessel B in this case would be the giveaway vessel because green means go and red means stop, just like with traffic lights. So um, threw in one more example here. In this case, um, we would uh, look at these two vessels, which are in what we call a meeting or head-on situation. So if these were both power vessels, you might assume that neither one would be the stand-on vessel and that they would both move to starboard to uh, get out of each other's way. But in this case, vessel A is a sailing vessel and vessel B is a power vessel. So in this case, vessel B is going to be the giveaway vessel because she is lower on the vessel priority or pecking order. So that's how we determine uh, that she is the giveaway vessel. And we'll review that real quick in two more slides. Um, one more example is in this case, we have a sailing vessel that wants to overtake a power vessel. And we'll recall that the overtaking vessel the overtaking vessel, that'd be vessel A, is always going to be the giveaway vessel regardless of vessel type. So vessel priority doesn't come into account here uh, because she is overtaking. So if you wanna go faster than the boat in front of you, you need to maneuver out of her way. So vessel A is overtaking and vessel A will be the giveaway vessel. So, we're going to cover, uh, just in review real quick, we're going to go over vessel uh, responsibility between vessels. So you may recall that responsibility between vessels is sometimes also known as vessel priority, the hierarchy, or pecking order. Hierarchy and pecking order being more slang terms, um, vessel priority is, is a fairly common term and responsibility between vessels is the actual name in the rules of the road. So we remember uh, the order of vessel priority by remembering our new rods catch fish, so purchase some. We're gonna uh, envision this uh, little bait shop that's selling some new fishing rods that they guarantee will catch you some fish. So you should come and purchase some. So our new rods catch fish, so purchase some. And by using that mnemonic, we take the first letter out of each of those words and apply it to a vessel category. So we're gonna start with overtake in. So overtake in a vessel that's being overtaken, taken, 
is going to have the highest priority. So overtaken vessels, regardless of other vessel type, will always have will always be the stand on vessel. Uh, after that, uh, new or N is going to be not under command. And remember, that's a vessel that by exceptional circumstances is having difficulty maneuvering. So um, that's a, a vessel that set out to be a regular old power vessel, but had some kind of exceptional circumstance. Usually, probably a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, usually probably like a, a propulsion failure or a steering failure, something along those lines that caused them to uh, be uh, not under command. Next is gonna be uh, RODS or R is gonna stand for restricted in her ability to maneuver. So remember that's gonna be a vessel that by the nature of her work that uh, is having more difficulty maneuvering. So that's a vessel that actually set out to have more difficulty maneuvering. So that's gonna be, um, some type of vessel that uh, by virtue of the, the type of work that she does is going to uh, be you know, restricted in her ability to maneuver. Good examples are like a dredge, a buoy tender, uh, something where they have to kind of try and maintain uh, position. So uh, next for catch or C is gonna be constrained by draft. And a vessel constrained by draft, I told you, is only a definition that we find in the international rules. We don't define that vessel category in the inland rules. So if we were doing a vessel priority for inland rules, we would just take that line out. But that's gonna be a vessel that's too deep to operate outside of, of the channel that they're, they're transiting. So we need to give them space. Uh, next fish or F is going to be fishing. So a vessel engaged in fishing, that's going to be any type of fishing um, other than just throwing some lines out of a ski boat. You know, this is going to be uh, commercial fishing uh, type operations and they're often dragging nets or long lines behind them. And so they're going to have a little more difficulty uh, uh, maneuvering. Uh, after that is going to be SO or S, which is sailing vessels. So sailing vessels, uh, notice um, I mentioned on Monday that there's a common misconception that sailing vessels have priority over all other types of power vessels. But you'll notice that sailing vessels are actually number six on a list of eight. So they're actually pretty far down the list. There's several other types of vessel categories that have priority over sailing vessels. Only two categories fall after sailing vessels. One is going to be power driven vessels. That's going to be your standard power driven vessel. Um, any type of vessel uh, powered by machinery, including a wing and ground craft, which is a very, very obscure, very uncommon nowadays uh, type of craft. But that'll be a wing and ground craft if they're operating on the surface. So if they're actually on the surface of the water. And then last, the only vessel that power vessels have priority over is seaplanes or wing and ground crafts that are uh, um, in flight. So um, they'd be in flight, not very far off the water, but but off the water nonetheless. So seaplanes, um, if they're maneuvering on the water or landing or taking off as well as wing and ground craft. So that uh, concludes our review of Monday's um, presentation. And we're gonna jump in now to lights and shapes. And so this is uh, rule 21 is the definition of lights and shapes. So these are all the types of navigation lights that you might display on your vessel. And what I've done is put up this uh, uh, matrix that shows uh, the name of the light, shows a, a picture of the light, and then a description of the light. So over here, we've got masthead light. A masthead light is going to be a forward-facing, always white light and it's gonna shine through 225 degrees. I've also added here uh, for those of us that, you know, particularly in Northern California, we like uh, participate in regattas and we do a uh, compass and rel relative bearing event and we tend to learn things in a 32 point system. So for those uh, uh, trying to relate to that, that's gonna be 20 points, 20 points on uh, of, of uh, 
a 32 point compass circle. So facing forward, um, equally spaced to either side and always white. So that's gonna be a mast headlight. And uh, we'll show um, how you display that when we uh, move into the next slide. So side lights, um, side lights are going to be red and green. We're always gonna have the red light on the port side of the vessel and the green light on the starboard side. And together, they'll prescribe the same arc as a masthead light, 225 degrees. So each of them is displaying 112.5. Uh, they're divided uh, straight ahead. So the, the green light will shine uh, to the starboard side and just abaft the beam. And the red light will shine to the port side and just abaft the beam. So that way, anybody that is approaching you from one side or the other will know which side they're approaching you from. Even if they can't make your vessel out well, like at night, they can see your lights and see which side they're approaching you from. Um, and if they were approaching you from the stern, they wouldn't be able to see either of your, stern, of your side lights. So that's going to be red on the port, green on the starboard, 112.5 degrees each. And for those that are counting points, that's 10 points of a 32 point circle. Uh, next is going to be a stern light. So the stern light is going to make up the difference uh, of, of a circle from the mast and mast headlight and side lights. So the stern light is going to be 135 degrees. It's always going to be white and it's going to face aft um, equally. So it's going to be a white light, again, 135 degrees. And again, uh, if you're counting points, that's 12 points at 135 degrees. So you'll notice that if you put a stern light and a mast headlight together, you get 360 degrees and that makes up a full circle. So um, you have, that way you, you have light shining in every direction. Um, so somebody can see you from any direction they approach, but the combination of lights they see will tell them where they're approaching from. Uh, the next light is gonna be a towing light. So a towing, not, towing light is, um, is just like a stern light with the exception that it's yellow. So these are lights we use. We're not gonna talk about them a lot tonight because we're not gonna get deep into tugboats, but a towing light is gonna be a light that tugboats use to indicate that they're towing and the number of, of towing lights they use will indicate um, the uh, length of tow. So they can, uh, um, that way you can uh, differentiate between a regular power vessel and a vessel that's towing um, at a distance at night. So again, towing light is gonna be yellow and 135 degrees, just like a stern light. It's gonna face aft and it's going to be 12 points. So um, it'll only, you'll only be able to see it if you're approaching from the stern. Um, we're, uh, we're gonna talk about an all-round light, um, also sometimes known as an all-around light. Um, they sound almost exactly the same, but you may see it written both ways. An all-around light, as it describes, is gonna be a light that shines 360 degrees. So this light can be seen from any direction. And we're gonna use these lights to uh, uh, differentiate between different vessel types. So different vessel types are going to put up different combinations of all around lights. Uh, these lights can be various colors. So an all around light could be, uh, could be uh, any number of different colors, um, red, green, uh, yellow, or white. And um, uh, in this case, in the, in the picture, we've indicated an anchor light which is gonna be a white all around light. So if you see a white all around light all by itself, that's an anchor light. Uh, that indicates that that vessel is anchored. Uh, you may see a white light with a combination of other, uh, other colored uh, all around lights that would indicate other things. So uh, at any rate, uh, all around light, 360 degrees, just like its name, name uh, describes. And that's 32 points out of a 32 point circle. Um, the last definition in the definition of lights is a flashing light. And a flashing light in theory could be any color. 
Uh, typically, the only place that you're going to see a flashing light, it's, it's probably going to be yellow on the front of a barge being pushed inland. Um, but regardless uh, of color, if, if it's a flashing light, it's going to flash 120 flashes per minute. So that's twice a second. So, you know, if you can imagine um, a light flashing twice a second, that's turning on and off twice a second, that's going to be about this fast. And typically, uh, with some exceptions, if you see a flashing light on the bow of a vessel, it's going to be yellow and it's going to be a barge either being towed alongside or pushed ahead in inland waters. Um, you won't see that in international waters. So, uh, that, but that's, that's the speed at which uh, the light should flash. Okay, um, do we have any questions this far? I thought... Uh... Yes, we do have okay. a couple. Great. So it took a minute to get off uh, mute, so I apologize. Oh, no worries. Zoom, uh, Zoom challenges. Yes, yes. Uh, so first question. Living in uh, Puget Sound, I think a big hazard is dealing with fishing nets. Is, you know, can you comment on that? Uh, I can a little bit. Yeah, I guess backing up, that's kind of in our, was in our review. Um, so I can a little bit. I haven't, uh, I haven't ever lived in Puget Sound. My brother actually does. I've worked a little bit in Puget Sound most of my career in San Francisco, but I have a lot of friends that work in Puget Sound. Um, and that is a big problem. Um, I'm not uh, uh, there. This this would be a a really deep conversation that goes into a lot of different uh, nuances. But um, one of the big problems up there is is fishing rights and and like indigenous people to that area. And um, there tends to be a problem. Um, it's also a uh, more there's a lot more fishing in in Puget Sound, um, actually in the Sound, than there is here in San Francisco Bay. Um, the the space is a little bigger and the water is a little richer with fish. So um, there is a big problem with people laying fishing nets across channels. Um, it's arguably by these rules illegal, although there are actually some um, there are some like uh, historic fishing rights that allow certain groups of people to use those areas. And so then you end up with this conflict of commercial vessel traffic and fishing nets. So it is a problem. I can speak from a little bit of personal experience in trying to leave Puget Sound on a Sea Scout vessel one time and encountering a fishing ground. So another one is, does WIG include hovercraft, airboats, et cetera? Uh, it does not. They would be power vessels. Um, hovercraft actually get some of their own light lights. Um, we're not going to go over those this evening, um, but a hovercraft is primarily a power vessel, although there are a couple um, light characteristics that they fly to indicate whether they're in displacement or a hover mode. An airboat would be strictly a power boat. Um, they, they don't uh, get anything special that just falls. So a wing and ground craft is a pretty unique type of craft that actually is more like a, more like a, a, an airplane that can't fly high. They depend on ground effect to, to stay in flight. So as soon as they get too high off the ground, they don't have that. They're very stubby winged airplanes kind of. Excellent. Well, last question for now, uh, for, Rule 21, inland rules also talk about special flashing light in addition to the flashing lights. Uh, they're same thing. Oh, same thing? Cool. Same thing, yeah. So that'd be a special flashing is, is the light that they'll talk about for using on the front of barges being pushed or, uh, um, and uh, um, there are some other types of flashing lights that don't get defined in Rule 21. Um, I'll actually show you one here in a couple slides, but um, there's a couple types of vessels that get kind of their own, own type of flashing light. But um, yeah, pretty much interchangeably flashing light versus special flashing light is, is the same thing. And uh, one just came in on chat. Is there a masthead light? 
pardon me, is a mast headlight located on top of mast? Uh, yes. So okay. a mast headlight is going to be located on top of the mast. Um, and de depending on the length of vessel, you may have one or two mast headlights, um, or even with tugboats, more than that. Um, and if you have a if you have a long longer vessel, you're going to have um, mass a mast headlight that's on a forward mast and a mast headlight that's on an aft mast. And we'll we'll get into that in a second. So uh, let's jump in uh, to to seeing how these lights are actually displayed on a vessel. And hopefully, I'll answer uh, a couple of your questions, and then we'll stop again in, in case I don't cover them uh, um, perfectly, and we'll take some more questions. So. I'm gonna move on to uh, my next slide is uh, still kind of talking about rule 21, just a, a different way of kind of showing how, how these lights kind of exist on a vessel. So uh, up here on the left, if you were to kind of co-locate all these lights, which typically on a vessel you don't, but you can see how they're all related in um, arc of visibility. So you'll see that a mast headlight is going to have the same arc of visibility as the two side lights together. So that's what you're going to see if you're approaching a vessel from the from the bow is you're going to see their mast headlight and their two side lights and then maybe a combination of other lights that describe more about that vessel. But for standard, um, for standard uh, smaller power vessels, this is this is what you'll see. And then if you were to approach a vessel from the stern, you'll see you'll only see their stern light. So if you're approaching a vessel from the stern, you'll only see a white light, you'll know that you're approaching them from the stern, as opposed to approaching them from one side or the other or directly from the bow. Um, here, I've used a graphic to show kind of how these lights might be displayed. You know, this is probably going to be, you know, like about a 36 foot like cabin cruiser. And you'll see that the mast headlight is displayed uh, on top of the mast. Um, the uh, side lights are going to dis be displayed lower on either side of the house. And often, uh, depending on the configuration of the vessel, they may have shields on them to make sure that they shine only in the arc they're, they're intended to. So if you, uh, if this, as, as you can see, like if they weren't right here on the side of the house, um, you might be able to see the green light from, from the other side. And so you would put up like a, like a shield that, that shields the light so it only shines in the direction it, it should. And so here they probably only have a shield on the aft side of the light. So, and then the stern light should be displayed as close to the stern as possible so that you, uh, um, that that light is shining aft and it kind of describes where your stern is to uh, somebody that's approaching. So I threw up this, uh, this graphic here. Um, we're not gonna get deep, as I said, into uh, uh, different vessel type lighting, but um, I, uh, this, I threw this up to kind of emphasize the importance of, of nav lights and vessel lighting. So if you were out, you know, this is kind of like a hazy evening um, and, you know, from a long ways away, it may be pretty hard to see this boat. You may not be able to see that they have gear um, hanging off the side. Um, this is probably some kind of dredge that's hanging gear off one side of the boat, but I can look at the lights and I can tell you an awful lot about this boat. Um, from it, I can tell you, I see two, uh, two mast headlights, uh, because it shows two mast headlights, then I know that it's, uh, um, that it's greater than 50 meters. That tells me um, if you have two mast headlights, you're a vessel greater than 50 meters. So that's uh, more than about 160 feet or so. Um, uh, I see a red, white, red, which tells me that this is a vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver. So, you know, maybe she's dredging. Um, I see these two red lights on her starboard side uh, flying off the mast, which indicates to me that that's not a safe side to pass her on because she's got this gear out. And then I see these two green lights on her port side, which indicate to me that that would be the good passing side. So if I needed to pass this vessel, I'd want to pass her on her port side. And then I see a green side light, which indicates to me that I'm looking at her from her starboard side. So I can tell all that stuff by seeing all these lights, even if I wasn't able to see the vessel. So 
um, that's just a, a good uh, indicator you know, of the importance of, of navigation lights. So you can tell a lot about a boat uh, by looking at her nav lights. So let's jump in um, and look at what different types of vessels uh, need different types of lights. So these are actually, um, these are actually uh, graphics straight out of the nav rules book. So this is exactly how they're displayed in the official publication. And again, um, here on the left, I've told you what vessel type it is. In the middle, we have a graphic of that vessel with the lights. And then on the right, the description of what those lights are. So we'll start off with a vessel under oars. Um, so a vessel under oars, if you're a vessel under oars, and you're out at night. Um, I do urge you all to be very careful going out at night in vessels this small. Um, they're very hard to see on the water at night. Um, one of the requirements in ordinary is to describe what type of lights are, are uh, required for paddle craft. Um, the term paddle craft is not actually used anywhere in the nav rules book. Um, and I, I've kind of taken that when I teach uh, teach my crew about nav lights and and what type of lights are required. I say, well, I like to say that the type of lights required for paddlecraft is the sun, and that's because uh, really low freeboard vessels like kayaks and and paddle boards and stuff, even with somebody in them that sticks up a little bit, are nearly impossible to see on the water at night if there's like any chop at all because you lose the vessel in the water and so um, it's very hard to see. But um, uh, other, other than that, I would, I would suggest that most paddle craft would fall under the same requirements as a vessel under oars um, by the intent of the rule. And a vessel under oars is required to carry an electric torch or lighted lantern, which in, modern speak means a flashlight. Um, so this, these rules were written quite a while ago when they used some fancy English English and said an electric torch or lighted lantern. But basically you are required if you are out on the water at night at a bare minimum to be able to produce a light that will you know, indicate your position to others on the water. So um, you need to be able to show that. So any vessel under oars needs to have some kind of flashlight to indicate that they're out there. Um, the same is true for a sailing vessel under seven meters. So um, uh, anybody who isn't up on their uh, metric conversions, a meter is 39 inches, which is just a little bit more than three feet. So a vessel of seven meters is, is right about 22 feet. So any vessel less than 20 meters, any sailing vessel rather, a sailing vessel less than seven meters is also required to um, carry a flashlight. And it's usually um, suggested that if you're going to try and light yourself, if you're a small sailing vessel and you're gonna try and light yourself with a flashlight, rather than trying to shine it out at others. Um, one, you may blind other people by shining a flashlight at them, and that's never good to try and blind somebody that has a risk of running you over. Um, but uh, the way to make yourself really visible is actually to shine the flashlight up into your sail. Um, you know, most sails are white, not all, but a lot of sails are white. And when you shine a flashlight up into the sail, it'll kind of make the whole sail glow and it'll make you most visible to, to other people. So that's a good, uh, good recommendation is if you're gonna try and light yourself on a small sailing vessel with a flashlight, use, you shine it up into the sail. So if we jump up into the next larger category of sailing vessel, that'd be vessels less than 20 meters. That's gonna be about you know, roughly 65 feet. Um, so vessels, sailing vessels less than 20 meters, they, uh, they need to have side lights. So that'd be your red and green, red on the port, green on the starboard, and a stern light, but no masthead light. Sail, sailing vessels won't, uh, won't show a masthead light like a power vessel will. Um, at, if the vessel is less than 20 meters, they may, if they choose to, uh, 
put all three of those lights in a single combination light. That'd be a single lantern that shines those uh, shines red to port, green to starboard, and white to aft um, at the top of their mast. So you'll notice in this picture, they're using what they call a combo light. So a combo light would have all three of those lights in one fixture. Uh, but if they do that, it needs to be at the top of the mast. So if you ever see a combination light way up in the air, that's gonna be a sailboat. And you'll know that it's a sailing vessel because it does not have a masthead light. You won't see white light shining forward. Um, so alternately, um, any sailing vessel underway can uh, just use uh, side lights and a stern light instead of a combo light. So if you're over 20 meters, this is a requirement that you light your vessel like this. You need to have separate side lights and a stern light that would be on the sides of and stern of your vessel. But at less than 20 meters, you can use a combo light if you choose, or you can light yourself the same as a larger sailing vessel. So again, note the absence of a masthead light. We only see side lights and a stern light. Um, Optionally, a sailing vessel. Um, I don't know why they make this optional because it really doesn't, uh, uh, since it's optional, you really don't know whether somebody's going to, to use this or not. But optionally, if you wanna indicate that you're a sailing vessel, um, you can fly a red all around over a green all around. And the, uh, the mnemonic or, or the saying that we use to remember that is red over green is a sailing machine. So red over green, sailing machine. And if you ever see a red over green light, you'll be certain that that's a sail, sailing vessel. But you should otherwise be able to identify it by its, by its side lights and lack of masthead light. Um, lastly, um, there are also day shapes in addition to lights where during the daytime, you can uh, fly these shapes that uh, people can see during the day that will allow you to know something else about the vessel uh, when lights aren't going to shine well during the day when it's too bright out. So um, a sailing vessel under power, so if this sailing vessel was under power during the day and still had their sail up, people might assume that she was still a sailing vessel. But recall from Monday, as soon as she fires up her engine, she's now a power vessel. And so if you are greater than 12 meters, that's gonna be about, uh, give or take about 40 feet. So if you're greater than 12 meters, then you're required to fly a cone with the apex down. So you can see that in this picture that it's a cone pointed down to indicate to others that although you look like a sailing vessel, you are actually a power vessel. Okay, so that's, that's lights and shapes for all of your sailing vessels and vessels under oars. So that's gonna be all you need to know about sailing vessels and vessels under oars. So before we jump into power vessels, did we generate any questions? None at the moment. Okay, that either means I've bored everybody to death or I'm doing a good job, one or the other. So let's jump into power vessels. So we're going to look at oh, we're going to look at basic lights for power vessels. So we're not going to dig into all the uh, like I said into all the different towing lights and all the different vessel category lights. But for basic power vessels, we're going to look at uh, what we're going to find on a on a basic power vessel. So we'll start up here at the top, and we'll look at power driven vessels. Uh, that are less than seven meters and travel at less than seven knots. So again, remember seven meters, that's about 22 feet. So if you're a vessel that's less than 22 feet and you go less than seven knots, and this is an international rule only. So in inland rules, this doesn't apply. Uh, power vessels inland are required to, to have uh, all power vessels inland are required to have side lights. But in international rules, if you do, if you are less than about 22 feet and you go less than seven knots, so fairly slow, you're only required to light yourself with one all around white light. 
So that's going to look just like an anchor light, although you'll know the difference uh, if you see something like that, probably because you're going to hear the outboard chugging along and the light is going to be fairly close to the water. Um, you'll notice the staff on a small power vessel uh, like this is probably only going to stick up about three feet. So if you see a small all around white light uh, very close to the water that that uh, appears to be moving, that's going to be a power driven vessel of less than seven meters and they're not going to be a very fast boat. So international rules only. So that's going to be Puget Sound out in the ocean. Hopefully you're not out in the ocean in a vessel this size um, or in in other countries. But here in the US, um, every power driven vessel is required to display side lights. So a power driven vessel of less than 12 meters, so that's gonna be less than about, uh, less than about you know, 39, 40 feet. Um, if you're a smaller vessel like that, you're required to light yourself with one all around white light and side lights. So um, you're gonna kind of get the same effect as if you used a masthead light and a stern light, because if you approach somebody from the front, you're gonna see one or both of their side lights and you're gonna see white. And if you approach somebody from the stern, you're only gonna see white. So it's kind of the same effect, but they allow you to do this uh, with fewer lights in, in smaller packages. So you'll notice uh, most smaller power driven vessels uh, for small boats like ski boats and things are going to use a combo side light where they're going to put both lights in the same fixture out on the tip of the bow and then you'll display the all around light close to the stern. And so that's what you'll see um, on smaller power vessels. When you get up into vessels that are greater than 12 meters, but still less than 50 meters. So less than 50 meters, that's going to be like you know, say about 160, 170 feet, um, you're going to have to actually display a proper masthead light, uh, two side lights and a stern light. So you'll notice here, they've got a masthead light up on top of the mast, uh, side lights displayed on either side of the house. So the masthead light should be up above the side lights, uh, up, on, up on the mast and the, the usually on a vessel this size, the uh, um, side lights will be displayed right on top of the house. So, um, so the difference will be the height of the mast. And then the stern light should be displayed as close to the stern as practical. So in this case, they're displaying it right on the stern. Sometimes it might be on the back of the house, but you should have nothing that will block that light from the stern. So if, if they were to display the light like on the back of the house, you can't have any deck fixtures that stick up and obscure that light. So that light has to be visible through its, its complete arc of 135 degrees. So power driven vessels less than 50 meters, but greater than 12 meters, uh, mast headlight forward, uh, side lights, and a stern light aft. When you jump up into the next vessel size, you get up into greater than 50 meters. So this is starting to get up into ship size. We're talking about vessels that are over about 170 feet. And in that case, you're gonna add a second masthead light and that's gonna indicate to somebody that this is a larger vessel. So you're gonna have a masthead light forward and a masthead light aft side lights and a stern light. So in this picture, they've displayed um, you know, what's pretty standard these days for ships where the wheelhouse is aft. Uh, a wheelhouse aft makes it a lot easier to see and steer your vessel. And so that's the way ships are typically built these days. Sometimes though, even with vessels that are this long, you may have what they call a stem winder where the, where the wheelhouse is built up forward. Um, and if the, the wheelhouse is up forward, you may, see the, the, you may see the side lights farther forward on the house, still with a mast headlight on top of the house, and then you would still have to have a mast headlight aft. So either way, with a 50 meter or greater vessel, a mast headlight forward and a mast headlight aft side lights and a stern light. So those are basic power vessels. Um, I did include uh, in this an air cushion vessel. So uh, I know somebody already asked a question about hovercraft. So in the rules, they define these as air cushion vessels, which is the same as a hovercraft. So a, an, a hovercraft operating in 
non-displacement mode. So if a, a displacement mode means that the, the, the craft is not hovering. So they've, they've not inflated their cushion and the boat is just sitting on its hull in the water and it's operating just like a power boat and it would light just like a power boat. But if you have an air cushion vessel operating in non-displacement mode, um, where where they've inflated their cushion and they're actually kind of hovering on top of the water, albeit you won't really be able to see space between them and the water. They're sitting right on the surface of the water, but if they're operating in non-displacement mode, in addition to, to shining the lights of a power vessel, they are supposed to shine an all around flashing yellow light. So that's where that flashing, that special flashing yellow light comes into play. Um, on hovercraft and on barges. So they're gonna display an all around, um, it's gonna face in every direction and it's gonna flash 120 times a sec, uh, 100, sorry, 120 times a minute. That's two times a second. Um, typically I'd say hovercraft are not super common. So in general, I'd say if you see a flashing yellow light, um, I would more assume that it's a barge then it's a hovercraft. Um, but if you did see this vessel from the stern, you'd see a stern light and a flashing yellow light, and you could assume it was a hovercraft uh, if you didn't, um, because uh, the flashing yellow light on a barge will only face forward. So that hopefully that answers any questions about hovercraft. Um, do we amass any other questions up until this point? Just that you have a fan club of people saying you're doing a good job. No, oh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I guess I'm doing a great job because we got no questions and people said I'm doing a great job. So I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the kudos. So uh, we'll move on. I did. I did. Uh, this is basically all the lights we're going to cover in ordinary um, lights after this tend to get pretty complicated. Um, so it's better to kind of absorb the basic lights in ordinary and then build off of that into able um, where you're going to take these basic light categories and you're going to add things to them. So if you can get this stuff down, Pat, where you, you know all your basic power vessel lights, then you can start adding vessel category lights or towing lights. And, and they'll make a lot more sense. So I would say uh, for everybody working on their ordinary, brush up on this stuff, get solid on it, so that when you get to ABLE, you can start working on those lights. Um, just, just for kicks, I did add in one special combination of lights that I know everybody always gets a kick out of, and that's submarines. So submarines operating on the surface um, will, will uh, use the same lights as a power vessel. So you'll notice in, in my picture here, we're looking at the starboard side of this submarine and you'll see that, that because the, the, light, the vessel is uh, long enough, um, they've got two mast headlights and they've got a uh, starboard nav light. But in addition to that, the uh, submarines use their own special special flashing yellow light and that's a so in addition to the uh, lights prescribed for a power vessel uh, a submarine operating on the surface uses a light that flashes uh, rapidly three times followed by a three second pause so that'd be like one two three one, two, three. And so that special combination of basically like a, a Morse code S followed by a three second pause is going to indicate to you that that's a submarine. Um, while that's fairly uncommon to see, you're probably not in your Sea Scout career going to run across a whole lot of submarines operating on the purpose. Just for kicks, I'll show you that every once in a while it does happen. This is actually a picture from about five years ago, the USS San Francisco, which is a nuclear uh, attack submarine transiting in front of uh, uh, the San Francisco waterfront. Um, they're just about to go underneath the, uh, the Bay Bridge. So uh, every once in a while, we get to catch a glimpse of this. So uh, this was actually right before the USS San Francisco was retired. She made one one final visit to her namesake city before being retired from service. So. Um, like I said, I think it was about five years ago that this happened. So you can see the uh,
quite a few usually. Yeah, <laughs> they they, uh, they usually stay underwater when they're traveling alone. This one is, uh, this, this picture, you can't see all of that because this picture was taken from one of the tugboats that was escorting her across the bay. But uh, she's being flanked by, by a fair number of tugboats that are gonna help her get alongside the dock, so. Okay, so let's jump from lights to sounds. Um, so we'll go from lights to sounds and uh, we can use sounds. Sometimes visibility is poor and it's gonna be kind of hard to see even lights. Um, we're gonna use lights anytime it's dark and we're gonna use lights anytime visibility is closing in, like it gets pretty foggy and it gets pretty, uh, you know, maybe pretty rainy and it's really hard to see, but it may get to the point where visibility is poor enough that it's even hard to see lights through the fog. And so we want to have um, some sound signals we can use. They're not quite as descriptive as lights, but they'll help us hear, you know, maybe how close something is. So we're going to talk real quick about definitions of lights. So first off, anytime you see in the rules the term whistle, that describes any sound signaling appliance capable of producing the prescribed blast. So the term whistle is actually um, quite often used to describe what we would probably in, in you know, normal language call a horn. So um, you'll hear it called the ship's whistle, but we're not talking necessarily about like a whistle like woo woo, we're talking about probably the horn. And so, um, but whatever sound device, if you were on like a little small boat, maybe you were out um, rowing or you were out in a small, you know, um, skiff or something, your whistle might actually be a whistle. Uh, it might be a handheld, you know, horn that you could just push a button on, or, it, you know, it could be as big as like a ship's whistle. So um, the other definitions we have are a short blast. I want to make clear um, a common problem we see out on the water is that people think short means really short. So note a short blast is of one second duration. So that's going to be like one one thousand. That's not going to be like two. That's going to be like two. So let me play. Uh, I've got a, a, a it's actually a video, but it just has sound of a short blast. So you kind of get stuck in your head how long a short blast actually is. Okay, so that's going to be a short blast. So a short blast isn't going to be just a quick toot on the horn. It's going to be a full second in duration. A prolonged blast is going to be the other type of blast we can use, and that's going to be four to six seconds in duration. Uh, we hear those played really short all the time um, because people just don't lean on the horn long enough. So a prolonged blast, when you're supposed to sound a prolonged blast, it should be four to six seconds long. And so just to get an idea of how long that is, I'm going to play a prolonged blast here. OK, so that's a lot longer than most people out on the water are typically going to play a long blast. So prolonged blast, remember, is four to six seconds. You should uh, um, that way you can really tell the difference between a short and a long. Uh, equipment for, for sound signals, um, that's, that's rule 33 here. So uh, different vessels are going to be required to carry different equipment. So a vessel less than 12 meters, that's going to be most of your small craft, you know, runabouts, ski boats and stuff like that, are only required to carry some means of making an efficient sound signal. So you could carry a whistle, you could carry maybe like a pump horn where you like squeeze something and it, it blows. You could carry one of those things where you have like the bottle of, of compressed air and you blow it. Um, uh, I've had some cool things before where you can kind of pump them up with a bike pump and then be able to blow it. That way they're kind of rechargeable. Um, they're kind of neat, neat backup devices, um, used all kinds of things. I've used ones, you know, that are, that the whole thing looks like a bike bump and you, you, and it, it blows when you squeeze it. So um, it's any means of, of making an efficient sound signal just to bring attention to yourself in, in poor visibility. Uh, if you're a vessel greater than 12 meters, but less than 100, you're required in addition to your whistle. Um, so that might be your horn. Um, you're in addition to that, 
you're required to carry a bell. So you have to be able to produce a ringing sound in addition to your whistle. So um, that's going to be most boats, you know, um, most decent sized boats, uh, a lot of our Bay Area Sea Scout boats, you know, we're required to have a bell. Um, interesting little factoid, there's no requirement for it to actually be mounted anywhere. Um, so a lot of boats that I used to work on, um, we'd shine the bell up real good and you'd be like, well, we don't want to hang this back outside and just let it get weathered. So a lot of times we'd shine our bells up real good and then we'd stick them inside the wheelhouse so that they'd uh, be nice and shiny and stay that way. And if you really needed to use it, you could kind of hang it out the door and, and ring it. Um, there's no, no special requirement for where you have to mount it. And then um, jumping up to our really big vessels, 100 meters. So that's going to be like, uh, we're getting up to about 320 feet or so. Anything larger than that is going to be required to carry a whistle, a bell, and a gong. So you've got to have like a deeper sounding bell. So I've got this, uh, this sound here that's going to kind of give you an idea of what the difference between a bell and a gong is. So this is going to be like a, a long vessel at anchor sounding their bell and their gong. And the idea behind that is you can see they, they sound a little different. You know, you want to have like a high pitch bell and a low pitch gong to on a longer vessel. If you were at, at anchor, you would ring one near the bow and one ring near the stern and hopefully give people an idea of how, how long your vessel is, if they can kind of hear that they're coming from different directions. So what are we going to do with these uh, sound signaling devices we have? Well, we're going oh, to play them again, apparently. Let me, uh, let me try and stop doing that and move on to the next slide. So what we're gonna do with them, um, I've got this up here. I used, uh, I put international rules here on the left, just like you'd find them in the book and inland rules on the right. This is one of those places where we're gonna find that the inland rules and the international rules diverge a little bit. Although in some of the places we're gonna notice that they actually mean exactly the same thing. So we're going to start off with maneuvering signals. We're going to talk about signals that we use for maneuvering. And what we mean by that is if we had two vessels that were meeting, how are we going to know which way they're going to turn? Well, you might say we learned in an earlier rule that you should always turn to the right. But what if for some reason you wanted to turn to the left because of some particular situation? You might use some sound signals to indicate that. Um, you could also try and call somebody on the radio and make passing arrangements, but these sound signals are prescribed in the rules. And uh, remember, uh, if, if everybody remembers from Monday, we talked about um, uh, one of the definitions was in sight. So these are passing signals for vessels that are in sight of each other. So if you can see each other, you can use your horn to indicate your intentions rather than having to raise somebody on the radio. So in, in international rules, one short blast, we're going to say, means I'm altering my course to starboard. So if I was cruising along, I'm going to, I'm going to sound one short blast, and I'm going to alter my course to starboard. The other vessel is going to sound one short blast back at me to say, yeah, I understand. And they're going to alter course to starboard. But notice, we're going to pass port to port by altering course to starboard. So in the international rules, they use this wording, altering course to starboard. But I'm going to think about, to try and remember this, that what I'm doing is I'm leaving the other vessel to port. So I'm always going to think about, in, in order to try and remember these rules, I'm going to think about where I'm leaving the other boat. So when I alter my course to starboard, I'm leaving the other vessel to port. And I'm going to remember that port is short and starboard is long. One short blast versus two short blasts. Two short blasts is longer. A starboard is also two syllables. Port is only one. So I'm going to use one short blast to indicate that I'm leaving you to my port side or in international rules, altering course to starboard. Two short blasts to indicate I'm leaving you to my starboard side or in international rules, 
altering course to port. So you can see there that in the inland rules, they used a different language than in the international rules, but they actually mean exactly the same thing. Leave you on my starboard, or I'm saying one thing and indicating the other. I'm sorry, leave you on my port or alter course to starboard. They mean the same thing. So you can remember them the same way. Port is short and starboard is long. Um, both sets of rules, international and inland, use three short blasts to indicate that I'm operating a stern propulsion. So if for some reason we ended up in a situation where we were so close that I felt that I actually had to back down and stop, I might indicate three short blasts on my horn to indicate that I'm operating a stern propulsion. I'm trying to slow down. I could also use that to indicate somebody to somebody that I was backing out of a dock. So if I was backing out of a dock, I could indicate three short blasts to let somebody know that I'm backing up. So three short blasts is operating a stern propulsion. Um, when we get to overtaking, international and inland, uh, they, oops, I'm sorry, they diverge again um, a little bit. So in international rules, if I'm going to overtake you on your starboard side, again, I'm going to leave you to port. I'm going to use two prolonged followed by one short. So in international, anytime I want to overtake somebody, I have to start with two prolonged and then indicate which side with one short. So again, I can remember port is short because I'm going to leave you on my port side. I'm going to overtake you on your starboard side leave you on my port side. Port is short, two prolonged followed by one short. In inland rules, you are not required to, to sound too prolonged. You can just indicate one short blast and that tells somebody that you're gonna overtake them on their starboard side or leave them to port. Same with overtaking somebody on their port side, I'm gonna leave them to starboard. Starboard is long, starboard is two syllables, so I'm gonna use two short blasts. In international, I have to precede that by two prolonged to indicate I'm overtaking, but in inland, no prolonged requirement. Almost the last uh, sound signal, but uh, arguably one of the most important is going to be what we call the danger signal. And international and inland rules use exactly the same danger signal. The danger signal is five short blasts. So if you ever hear somebody sound five short blasts, that five consecutive short blasts, that means that they think that there is an imminent chance of a collision and they're asking you to take action to try and stay out of the, to, to avoid the collision. So um, I've definitely heard that before um, with uh, like big ships coming quickly down a channel where they have to keep up their speed. That's a big problem in Oakland here in the San Francisco Bay where they've got a cross current situation, got to keep up their speed and maybe suddenly a small sailboat starts crossing their bow. Those five short blasts says, turn around and go the other way. I need you to get out of my way. So five short blasts. Uh, one prolonged blast is really just a, hey, I'm here signal. Um, one prolonged blast is going to be leaving a dock or approaching a blind corner. So um, and you can also just kind of use it as a, hey, I'm here. I, I hear ships use that sometimes before they get to a danger signal situation to just kind of indicate, hey, you know, you're getting into a situation that isn't going to be so good. It's not an imminent collision yet, but um, that's basically the, hey, I'm here signal, one prolonged blast. So leaving a dock, if you were going to be leaving a dock, you might sound one prolonged blast to indicate to others that I was stopped and tied up to this dock, but I'm going to be getting out into the channel now. Or if you're approaching a blind corner in a, um, in a, in a channel where you can't see around, you might sound one prolonged blast to let somebody on the other side know. So um, I use the, uh, the saying, port is short and starboard is long anymore and something's wrong to try and remember these one, two, three, and five short blast combinations. So port is short, one short, I'm leaving you to port. Starboard is long, two short, I'm leaving you to starboard. 
anymore. Well, if I got into a situation where I had to back down and sound three short blasts, that means something's wrong or something's really wrong if I have to sound five short blasts. So that's the saying I use to try and remember the short blast combinations. Port is short, starboard is long, any more, and something's wrong. And always think about where you're leaving the other vessel. Okay, um, so just a quick uh, uh, review of that kind of in a graphic form, uh, we'll show here. Um, in all of these situations, the vessels are going to be leaving the other vessel to port. So here A is overtaking. So this would be a one short blast situation. They're overtaking and leaving B to port. I'm leaving you to port, one short blast. A and B in a meeting situation here in the middle, they're both going to alter course to starboard and leave each other to port. That'd be one short blast. And here in a crossing situation, very similar to the meeting situation, A is gonna alter course to starboard and leave B to port, one short blast. Okay, the opposite would be true for two short blasts. A boat would be going the other direction every time. Okay, did we accumulate any questions up until that point? Yes, there are a few. So okay. one is, will you be doing more of these? These are great. So <laughs> uh, I can try. I have I actually I have this kind of full presentation up through the ABLE requirement, but it uh, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, all the lights together sort of add to quite a bit of time. So I actually I do ordinary in about two hours. Uh, I do ordinary and ABLE together in about six. And so I usually break it up into several meetings, but we can uh, we can definitely do some more. Awesome. Next is uh, technical yeah, or hypothetical. On a 40 foot sailboat, is there a rule on how high the side light should be on the bow? Uh, no, they should really be on the um, up so that they're on the uh, uh, top of the deck or side of the house. Um, that just, you know, the in general, the height of lights is going to kind of give you a pretty good indication of the size of vessel. Um, you know, big ships, the lights are going to tend to be higher, um, you know, sailing vessels and smaller power vessels are going to tend to be a little bit lower. Uh, that one exception is if you're using that combo light on uh, less than 20 meter sail vessels, you'll see that whole light assembly, but they'll be very close together. So that kind of indicates that that's a sailing vessel and the lack of the mast headlight. So no, no, no exact prescription of the height. Gotcha. Uh, let's see now, one, uh, no stern light on a surface sub? Uh, you couldn't see the stern light. That In that picture, you should have, uh, it, it should have kind of, it was a really two-dimensional two picture, but that would have been a, a, a vessel that was pointed just a little bit at you, so you couldn't see the stern light. You'll, you, in theory, you should never be able to see the stern light at the same time that you can see the masthead light or lights and the side lights. If you can see the stern light, that should be the only light you should see. Let's see now, we have another, aren't inland rules signals of intent that require agreement? as opposed to international signals of action. Yes, yes. So in, in, in theory, um, there should always be an answer in the, in the intent, right? And so particularly, um, I would say, although that, that is a true, true statement, particularly with overtaking, um, because that goes back to our rules about overtaking and the fact that the vessel ahead has the, um, you know, gets to make the decision. So that, like, you know, that signal would always require a, an answer so that you know, um, uh, that you, you know, that there's, there's agreement, but yes, that's actually a true statement, but it's a, that's kind of getting a little more into the minutia than, than I, I typically get in this level of presentation. So uh, how many seconds are short and prolonged blasts? Uh, one one full second for a short and four to six for prolonged. Excellent. And the, the other is, is the prolonged blast like a foghorn? Um, it doesn't have to be any particular pitch. It just has to be that length. And so typically 
larger vessels are going to have, you know, deeper horns because they're going to have bigger horns um, and, and usually more capability to blow them. So, you know, a big ship is going to have a lot of compressed air capacity. And so they're usually going to have bigger, sh bigger horns, deeper and, and probably louder and longer, um, you know, like their capability is longer. You can hear them from farther away, but uh, no, no particular like tone. Um, it's, it's really the length that's the important part. Cool. Oh, that's all the questions. Okay, well, let's jump into the last part of our presentation for tonight. We're going to talk about other ways that we use these sound signals. So the other ways we can use these sound signals is to indicate um, in restricted visibility who we are or, um, you know, to an extent what we're doing. So we didn't get into all the lights for all these different types of vessels, but if you look at the list of vessels in the vessel priority, um, each of them might indicate a little bit differently um, who they are. So just like if we were using lights to understand what types of vessels were out there and how we might you know, avoid a collision with them and who's the stand on vessel and who's the giveaway vessel, we can use sound signals as well. So vessels are categorized a little bit more than they are with lights. So you might not be able to determine exactly what type of vessel it is, but you'll be able to, to group these in categories. So we start off really basic um, at, at, at the top with a power driven vessel making way. So that's like our kind of basic type of vessel is always going to be a power driven vessel making way. So that's a vessel that's actually, you know, not anchored, not tied up and not only and, and not just floating, they're actually, you know, making way and moving along and to indicate in restricted visibility. So if it's really hard to see, it gets really foggy. They're going to sound one prolonged blast and they're going to do it every two minutes. So at least every two minutes. So they're going to sound one prolonged blast. Remember, that's going to be four to six seconds. And then le less than two minutes later, they're going to do it again. And then less than two minutes later, they're going to do it again. So they're going to keep doing that uh, every, every two minutes, as long as the restricted visibility uh, you know, uh, continues. Um, if the fog lifts, they would uh, stop, stop sounding their signals. But um, that's going to be a power-driven vessel making ways. So cruising along, uh, going from somewhere to somewhere else. If that power-driven vessel is making no way, now making no way um, doesn't mean that they've like run aground or that they're anchored or anything like that. It just means that they're kind of floating. So this is a power-driven vessel that's decided to kind of stop but they're not secured in any way. They're not tied up, they're not anchored, they're not aground, they're just not moving. And to indicate that, that they're sitting still, they're gonna sound two prolonged blasts every two minutes. So they're gonna sound one prolonged blast, followed by another one, and then two minutes later, they're gonna reproduce that again. So we're gonna go two prolonged blasts to indicate that you're a power-driven vessel making no way, just, just kind of floating along. So next, we're going to group together most of our other vessel, power vessel types and sailing vessels. So most of our other types of vessels, that's going to be a vessel not under command, a vessel restricted in ability to maneuver, a vessel constrained by draft, a sailing vessel, a fishing vessel, or a tugboat. All those different kinds of vessels are going to use the same sound signal, and they're going to indicate one prolonged blast followed by two short. So we're gonna make the assumption that instead of trying to remember a different type of sound signal for all of those, we're gonna know that all of those different vessels have priority over a power vessel. So basically any vessel that has priority over a power vessel is going to sound one prolonged blast followed by two short. And again, they're gonna do it every two minutes. So. Um, every two minutes, they're going to sound a sound signal to say, hey, I'm here, and this is who I am. Um, only in international rules, um, a fishing vessel 
or a vessel restricted in ability to maneuver that has anchored is going to also use the same signal. So um, that's that's kind of a little bit of an obscure rule because it's only international and it only applies to these two types of vessels. But a fishing vessel or, or a vessel restricted in ability to maneuver that has one or more anchors out is going to also use one prolonged and two short. So that groups together, you know, a, a whole bunch of vessels that you can remember all share that same sound signal. Um, the next signal that we're going to learn is uh, is for a vessel being towed. So typically that's probably going to be a barge, but it could be like a ship that is being towed because it broke down or another boat. And this, of course, is only going to be a sound signal used if the vessel is manned. If it's a barge with nobody on it, they're going to have a really hard time sounding a sound signal because there's nobody there to do it. But if the vessel is manned, then you, you right after the tugboat, that's towing you sounds there one prolonged followed by two short, you're gonna follow that up with one prolonged followed by three short. So it's gonna sound like one prolonged, two short, one prolonged, three short. And that's gonna to indicate to somebody that that, that that towed vessel is manned, that the vessel that's being towed has, has people on it. And it's going to give people a good idea of how long that tow is. Sometimes those tows can be really long. I mean, a couple thousand feet long. And so you could have a tugboat sound that sound signal. If there's somebody on the barge that could sound that sound signal and let people know, hey, look, I've got this really long tow out here and this barge is quite a ways behind me. That'll give you a better idea by listening to where the sound signal is coming from of how, how long that tow is. Um, that's going to be pretty uncommon because usually uh, while vessels are being towed um, out on a wire, if they're being towed astern, you typically don't have personnel on them. Uh, I work for a tugboat company now that we have manned barges. We have people that live on our barges. But if we're going to tow it out at sea, we take the people off the barge and they either ride on the tugboat or they don't go. So, um, so that's going to be an uncommon situation. But if it, if, if it occurs, that's one prolonged, three short. Um, when we're at anchor, all vessels that are greater than 20 meters um, inland, it, you're, it's required if you're greater than 12 meters, all vessels at anchor are going to use a bell. That's that bell you're required to have. Uh, and they're going to ring that bell for five seconds. So you're going to go ding, 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 for five seconds to indicate that you're there at anchor. So that's going to tell people that you're at anchor. And you'll notice that's also uh, um, what, what a lot of uh, buoys do is they ring a bell. And so it's kind of like, that's almost kind of like an anchored vessel as well. So that tells you that there's something out there that's probably not moving and you're going to want to avoid them because they're sitting there not moving. Um, if you get up into those vessels that are over 100 meters, remember we said that a vessel over 100 meters is required to carry a gong as well. And that's so that a vessel over 100 meters can ring their, ring their bell uh, when they're at anchor um, up at the bow, and then they can ring a gong at the stern. And hopefully we kind of get an idea of how long that vessel is, how big that vessel is, by listening to where the bell was, followed by where the gong was. And that's that video I played, was a, was a greater than 100 meter vessel at anchor. So they were ringing the bell for five seconds, and then dong, dong, ringing the gong for five seconds. Um, optional for small boats. Um, this is if you were small enough that you didn't carry a bell or a gong. Optionally, you might at anchor uh, use one short, one prolonged, one short. So that would be for small vessels that didn't have a uh, um, it didn't have a bell or gong to ring to indicate at anchor. Um, so if you thought somebody was approaching you, you would you would ring one short, one prolonged, one short. Um, the, uh, if you are aground, we consider that to be different than, a, than at anchor. Um, this is kind of like an accidental anchoring. If you ran aground, you might want to indicate to people. So uh, if, if you're aground, you ring a signal kind of like being at anchor because you're kind of like being at anchor, except before you ring your bell for five seconds, you're going to ring three distinct bell rings. So you're going to go 
dong, 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 for five seconds. And then you're going to follow it again with three distinct bells. So that's going to indicate to somebody that you're at a ground rather than an anchor. And the same is going to be true for vessels over 100 meters. So you're going to do that same thing. And then just like if you were at anchor, you're going to follow it with five seconds of gong. Um, vessels less than 12 meters, you're really small. Um, you're, you're, gonna, you're required not necessarily to follow any of these rules. Um, if you're less than 12 meters, you're a small boat. Uh, one, I'd recommend probably not being out in dense fog where people can't see you. But if you do find yourself in that situation, sometimes fog can close in pretty quick. You need to have some kind of efficient sound signal to try and tell people that you're out there. So hopefully you've got some kind of horn, some kind of whistle, because you're required to carry some kind of sound signal that you can signal every two minutes to try and indicate to somebody that you're out there. Um, and then um, pilot vessels, this is just one um, to try and help ships find their pilot vessel when they're inbound. Uh, pilot vessels will use whatever appropriate signal above here. So if they're a power driven vessel making way, they would use one prolonged. If they were at anchor, they'd use their bell. But then um, if, or I'm sorry, anchor situation wouldn't apply. I apologize. It, it, it's only if they're making way. So basically it's gonna be a power driven vessel making way. We don't have a lot of sailing pilot vessels anymore, although way back in the day we did. Power driven vessels making way, they're gonna sound one prolonged and then they're gonna follow it up with another prolonged and four short that indicate that they're a pilot vessel. And that helps ships find their pilot vessels in the fog. And then once they do, then they're hopefully gonna make radio con con contact and, and try and get, get alongside so they can get their pilot on board. Um, sometimes if the visibility is so restricted, they'll, they'll close a bar and not let ships come through because they can't see well enough. So I know that's a lot to absorb. Um, uh, maybe some, some guys are out there scribbling, trying to scribble down notes. Keep in mind that all of this, everything that I have taught you guys, Monday and today, is all in that NAV rules book. So it's all in one single book. And you've got those two URLs that are uh, um, the two web links that, that were posted on Facebook that you can find uh, two different versions of that book. One again looks a lot like the book and one looks a little bit more like a web format, but they have the same information in them. So if you don't have your own copy of the paper book, all the information that I've taught you is in that single book. And a lot of it's in the Sea Scout manual, although it's a little interpreted and, um, and it's, not, it's, it's not as complete because the rules of the road book has everything. So um, with that, um, uh, that's, that's the end of my presentation. We talked about lights and sound signals, but I'm happy to answer any questions that have, have uh, come up throughout the entire presentation. So we have a few. So one okay. is, will a buoy bell and a vessel bell sound alike? Uh, quite, quite possibly. Um, that really depends on, you know, what bell the, the, um, the uh, buoy has and what bell the, the boat has. But yeah, typically they're probably gonna sound a lot alike. The idea is that they're regular, high, re reasonably high pitched relative, relative to like a gong, but um, they could sound very similar. Um, usually bigger buoys have bigger bells that are gonna ring a little bit deeper. Um, and, uh, but the, the neat thing about the buoy bells, um, which doesn't really answer that question, but it's just kind of a neat fact, they're, they're not powered by anything. They're just powered by the buoy rocking back and forth and having the ringer ring in the bell. Or sometimes on the bigger buoys, they'll have like four ringers on the outside of the bell that rock back and forth and hit the buoy or hit the bell. So yeah, they could sound very similar. Our, I know the answer to this, but it's all, all you, are horns only used during bad weather? Uh, no, um, you know, just like we, uh, um, you could use, uh, you could use your horn for all your maneuvering signals would be in good weather. So all the stuff we talked about on the previous slide, um, if I back up, all of these sound signals would be used uh, not necessarily in bad weather. This wouldn't be restricted visibility 
a sound signals. This would just be maneuvering signals. So, uh, uh, in fact, you know, on our boats, uh, you know, those of us that sea scout, uh, you know, in and around the Port of Redwood City, we'll use our uh, maneuvering signals. Like we'll use one, one, uh, one prolonged to indicate we're leaving a dock. And uh, most of us bow into our docks there in Redwood City. So we'll follow it with three short to indicate we're backing up. So you'll hear one prolonged followed by three short. Um, we've got a lot of like uh, smaller vessel traffic in our area. Um, we tend to be some of the bigger boats around there, uh, except for some of the ships that come down. And so, you know, sometimes we want to indicate to the sailboats around, you know, even when when its visibility is good, they might not be looking our direction when we start moving. And so we want to let them know. If at anchor all night due to fog, do you ring the bell all night long until fog lifts or you lift anchor? Yes. Yes is the short answer. Absolutely. You've got to ring the, if you're at anchor, you need to ring your bell every two minutes if it's, if visibility is closed in. Um, now that said, on a lot of boats now, this stuff is automated. So um, most nowadays, even modestly priced radios that you buy will have a PA function. And if you hook a speaker up to your PA, the radio has a timer in it that will play all these sound signals for you. So um, a lot of a lot of most ships nowadays have uh, what they call fog signal timers, and you just push a button on it and tell it which which signal you want it to do, and it's automatically hooked up to. Uh, usually the bell is uh, is just automated. There's no actual bell, um, although you're still legally required to carry a bell. But um, and then the fog signal timer will also be hooked up to your horn. Uh, to a, a solenoid. So, so that said, the answer is yes, but a lot of this stuff can be automated these days pretty easily. In yeah, fact, okay. even our even our old our old Coast Guard cutters that are our, our Sea Scout vessels in Redwood City um, that were built in the '50s had automated fog signal timers. Yeah, I, I can't think of a more unfun Sea Scout job of being on an anchor watch where they have to every few minutes. That's uh. Well, hopefully, if you're in that situation, you're probably keeping a lookout anyway. I mean, I wouldn't want to anchor somewhere that I thought I was going to get hit and then go to sleep. So, yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, you know, it's pretty commonplace on our boats, on the scout boats, that we keep somebody up whenever we're anchored, regardless of visibility. So you would just kind of add to their job, you know, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So... Can a 50-foot sailboat making way and reduced visibility use a bell instead of a horn? Um, the bell, uh, a 50 foot sailboat. So let me see, where does that fit in? That's going to be, um, a 50, no, because, um, any sailing vessel is going to fit into that, um, still need a horn category because a bell, bells are, are pretty much, um, you know, saved for anchoring. So, You'd, you'd be kind of confusing somebody if you were making way and ringing a bell. You'd, and, want, to use, you'd want to use a horn or whistle or something along those lines that's, that continuously sounds. Last two. Uh, thank you for doing this. It was extremely helpful. And thanks, Max. Very useful info. This might be the most well-received comments that we've ever had on doing a technical webinar so well, i appreciate well, yeah. it yeah We're, this was exceptional okay um, cool so everyone thank you for tuning in max thank you for your expertise absolutely yeah. and i'm sure we'll find other fun things that we can talk about to help people be safe mariners sounds great yeah i hear there's some other great ones coming up so i know i was talking to uh Mr. Love uh, last night about putting, he's putting together some piloting. So mm -hmm. sounds like there's some great webinars coming up. Yeah, we, uh, we sent the outline in and we're, uh, we're filming parts for the ground tackle one this weekend. So great. Should be a good time. So everyone, thank you for tuning in. Max, give my best to Laura and we'll see you all very soon. And if you want to catch these, we'll be on the YouTube channel. And uh, these are also saved to Facebook since they're uh, uh, live videos there as well. So two ways to watch. 
So everyone have a great evening. All right. Thank you. Take care.